Schopenhauer said, forget about a happy life. If you focus on trying to be happy, you're going to end up unhappy. What you focus on is trying to be the best you can be in the things you care about, whatever they might be. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Sen, and today I have the great pleasure of having back on our favorite monthly guest, Dr. Peter Rogers. Dr. Rogers has been a Stanford and Harvard-educated neuroradiologist and imaging guided surgeon for over 30 years. And on his own YouTube channel, he lectures on topics like nutrition, toxicology, and more. And today, we'll be talking about mainly psychology and psychiatry and finding direction in life, what makes a good life. We'll be diving to philosophical questions like, what's the meaning of life even? So, Dr. Rogers, how does one live a happy and purposeful life today? Oh, well, that's kind of complicated, but I'll go through some of that stuff. I tend to like the quote by uh, Schopenhauer. He says, it's impossible to live a happy life. A smart man must choose to live a heroic life. And I think there's some truth in that. By that, I mean, you can't get everything you want. It's just not going to happen. So you look at your situation and you say, what's the best I could do and make the most of that? And I think you have to focus on a few narrow things because you only have so much time and energy. And but if you do that, you'll you'll do the best you can. And that's relevant because I think what I see most people do is they can't make up their mind. They just go through the day and they're kind of sad and nothing ever changes in their life. <laughs> Versus I think if you say, well, I might not be able to do things one and two, but I can do things three and four. I'm going to do things three and four as well as I can. And just, you know. How does one d discover what it is that they're meant to do? They're born to do that they're best at. Um, I could go into some of those things. And well, I think it's good to do a lot of reading when you're young because you get ideas and perspectives. For example, for a young person making these decisions, I would read Soren Kierkegaard. Soren Kierkegaard would say, you know, you have to take a choice between anxiety or stagnation. When you're making difficult decisions and trying to move forward and improve yourself and try new things, you're going to be anxious and, and kind of stressed and tense. You're moving into new territory, if you will. But if you don't, then you stagnate. And a lot of people do that. You just sort of go with the flow. So you have to be pushing through new barriers and accept the, the stress that comes with that. Hmm. And at what point... Um, for example, you, your, your wrestling career, at some point you had to say, this is something I'm really good at, but I have to walk away from. So yeah, how does it someone walk Because of injuries, because of injuries, because I was a really talented guy. If I hadn't gotten injured, I should have been a national champion, et cetera. But my friends were national champions. The guys who I had more talent than in high school became national champions, world cup champions, all this stuff. So it was very painful for me because it was also fun. A big part of being an athlete was the social life that went with it it's very high status in high school to be a good athlete. So when I lost that, it was like my status was declining. And then also going to Stanford as a wrestler, I was originally going to go to Iowa. So you go to Stanford, people don't care that much about wrestling out in California, especially not at Stanford. So it's sort of like this big drop. Um, and then my friends that went to state schools, they got much better social life than I did at Stanford. So anyways, I had to deal with that. And part of what happened in my mind was I'm like, being injured. I, think, I don't know if we talked about this before, but it was a difficult time for me. I was not sure I could keep wrestling. I got repeat fracture and stuff. And then um, I was thinking about dropping out of Stanford, quitting wrestling. And the coach, Mark Schultz, talked to me. He goes, Pete, you got talent. Just hang around with me next couple months. And he's kind of a real tough, scary guy. He says, got to join the athlete fraternity, hang around wrestlers. You got to hang around wrestlers so you think like a wrestler. And I wrestled in all, once I got a little better, I wrestled in all the off-season competitions and I just decided being, or it's one thing I would say the kind of, what's the point of that story? You want to be around people who are really good at what you like to do. Let's say you want to be a psychologist, find out who all the best psychologists are, talk to the ones that are in person, you know, like Doug Lyle or something over at True North, hang around with him, see what you can learn from him. But then also um, start reading about all the ones on the uh, internet and stuff and watch their videos. There's a lot of good videos. I think Academy of Ideas has great videos about psychologists. And I could kind of go through the history of psychology a little bit here. Not, I don't, not all the details. Not like, see, when people teach for school, they emphasize completeness, okay? But the truth is no one cares about completeness. What we really care about is what matters to us. And so in that setting, I think we have to start out with, it used to be your psychologist was kind of like related to religion, if you will. In you know, westernized countries, there's priest or the pastor or the equivalent, so to speak. But then there was sort of a, a decline in religion towards the late 1800s. And the big new thing was psychoanalysis coming out by Sigmund Freud. And Sigmund Freud, you know, the guy was a genius, but he was also a bit of a jerk. He did not 
care that much about the patients. He was making money. He turned his back to him. I mean, he said that he would do that to maintain objectivity. Because if you're looking at a person, you'll try to please them to some extent in the conversation. He felt he could get a better um, revelation, if you will, out of them by, you know, conducting the psychiatric interview in that way. But he also exaggerated a lot of things. He exaggerated the importance of sexuality and he almost pushed a depravity onto the situation. You know, the reason you're not happy is because you want to have sex with your mother. That's kind of crazy, okay? And I can tell you, boys don't know anything about sexuality when they're young. I don't believe that Oedipal theory at all, zero, okay? Then out of Freud and all his ideas, he did a lot of crazy things people don't know about. Like if a woman was frigid and wouldn't sleep with her husband, they would give her electroshocks, okay? So there's a lot of crazy stuff that's not in widespread news. And you know who's really good is Thomas Shaw's. You ever heard of Thomas Shaw's? Uh, he's the how, guy how do you spell his last myth, name? The myth of psychotherapy. It's it's hard to spell. S-Z-A-Z-S. It's hard to spell. Trust me, you'll find him real fast. The myth of psychotherapy. That guy is a genius. He's real funny too. Um, so he'll we'll, we'll come to him in a little bit, but he wrote that book. He's extraordinarily bright and very interesting. Okay, so then the big thing I think that came out of Freud was uh, Carl Jung and Alfred Adler, okay? Alfred Adler had a little more in common with Freud and I actually found him helpful in my own life. It was sort of like all my friends are now, you know, all Americans, national champions, and here I am trying to get over my injury, even potentially thinking of quitting the team. So I was really sad, really sad. It was kind of like my life went from being great. I was super popular and had a lot of friends in high school and had a great family. Then I go out to California. I don't know a single person. I sit around in my dorm room all the time um, initially, I was scared I was going to flunk out, but I started doing better and better in school when I figured out how school works. Uh, so anyways, what I'm trying to say is Alfred Adler has what's called the inferiority principle, whereby when a person is sad about a failure or a disappointment setback in their life, they can refocus their energy into something new. And to compensate for their inferiority in one area that's important to them, they have energy to put into something else. And that could be similar to what Freud would term sublimation. Um, and I also think Dabronsky's theory is really good. There's a Kashmir Dabronsky, he's a Polish psychiatrist who came up with the theory of personality, disintegration and reintegration. I think it's a great thing. It's super popular with gifted schools nowadays. So the gist of it is that you have to accept losing something that's important to you. You don't want that, but you have to accept it. And what you do is you sort of rechannel that energy. Instead of just being angry and sad, you rechannel it into achieving in another area. And I think that's a common thing. Like anybody, you when you reach a, a turning point in your life, a crossroads, like let's say you uh, are going to go to medical school, you then you finish medical school, you have to decide, am I going to go into surgery or a medical field? And if you, whatever you go into, you have to give up a whole other thing. You have to give up all your thoughts, all your dreams of that, your daydreams, and you just have to accept what you're going into. So that's hard to do, actually. And you get buyer's remorse and all that stuff. But anyways, what Kazimir Dabronski said is, if you can rechannel your energy into this new thing, you could be happier from that. And it kind of came out of a conversation with my mother too. I'm like, mom, you know, I don't want to stay here. This is at Stanford's little freshman in my dorm room, all lonely. I'm like, I want to come home to Illinois, Chicago area. And I don't want to go to school. And she's like, just give it a try for one year. And then, you know, I told her I'm injured again. She's like, God doesn't want you to be a wrestler. He wants you to be a doctor or a scientist. You're going to be a great doctor or scientist. And I'm like, okay, mom, I'll go with that. And so that was good for me, though, because instead of just being kind of sad and frustrated and not to do, I'm like, I've got something to go for. And I kind of had in my mind's eye, OK, my life sucks right now. But if I work really hard, I could have this great life as a scientist or a doctor. And I envisioned it that way. And it was always like that was the light in the, you know, at the end of the tunnel or something, that there was hope. My life wasn't going to stink forever. I was really sad. I would cry of loneliness in my room. I would cry because I was so sad. All my friends are going on to be champions. And here I am. You know, I was, I ended up being reasonably good, but not like before. Like before was, you know, these guys were all, all, all Americans, national champions. My coaches were Olympic champions. So I was definitely the lowest status guy amongst the guys who were really good in wrestling. Okay. So anyways, that hope of someday making up for, and I also, I blamed myself. Because I kept coming back early after I'd fractured my uh, growth plate on my collarbone clavicle. So I was mad at myself and I almost like I couldn't forgive myself. It's like, you ruined your life, you stupid idiot. I was, and when you're mad at yourself, that's not good because you got to hang around with yourself all the time. So anyways, I kind of eventually figured out the whole academic game and became super great at school, which I like. But I'll tell you something, if I could do it over again, it's a lot more fun to be a wrestler. And it is to, to go down the doctor path. It is. We are always laughing and cracking up. The tournaments are fun. And you're, it's very social. You're around a lot of people. 
Whereas academics, and it might be also a factor of where I went to school. Stanford's kind of a lonely place because there's there's really not much social things going on there. You live you live in a big field. Okay, then there's no town, there's no bars, there's not like there would be a party once every three four months. I mean, the reason I never had a girlfriend in four years at Stanford. Okay, and the reason for that I think was because, like, if I had to say how does a man attract a woman, I think there's like three things you got to know. Number one, you got to have some status and whatever is gives status in that environment. Number two, um. You have to know how to talk to them. You call that game or whatever you want to call it. But there's a third thing that people don't often think about. It's access. The reason I never had a girlfriend at Stanford is because I never talked to any girls. I didn't. It's not like I got rejected all the time. I only asked out one girl in four years and she laughed in my face. And don't get me wrong. I had tutored her in economics because economics for me was kind of like a joke. Okay. I knew I didn't even have to go to class. I get an A. So she would go to class, give me a homework, and I'd give her the answers. I'd show her how to do it. And at the end of the semester, I asked her out and she was really nice about it, but she just kind of laughed. And I could tell that's just how Stanford was. It was there wasn't much status in being an athlete over there. There wasn't even much status in being a great student. You know, I was student athlete of the year over there. I was a great student over there. I was getting A pluses in the hardest classes, but that didn't yield any status. It just didn't. So anyways, um, then I also, when I went to med school, I went in a sort of a bad neighborhood. A lot of med schools are in uh, bad neighborhoods in the cities. And so there was no social life there either. And because I'd been away for all through college, I didn't know anybody over there either. So I spent a long time being lonely. I didn't like it. Um, and finally, things started getting better later in residency and whatnot. But it was a long time to be lonely. I, I always had a nice girlfriend in high school. And all kinds of fun, exciting things happened on the weekends and parties. Whereas then, eight years in a row, pretty much, no. Uh, so that was difficult to accept. But I had to, you know. Um, but anyways, I think that's an important point in, psych in psychology. Is Alfred Adler and Dabronsky, and I like that. It's a little bit, it's like Christian redemption, is that you failed or you're sad or you're disappointed, but you try and something new and good can happen. You, in a sense, redeem yourself and, and whatever that means to you as an individual. Um, coming out of that, though, then psychology, I think, went into what I would call a bad phase with B.F. Skinner. B.F. Skinner points back to atheistic Darwinism and eugenics, basically saying that humans don't have any intrinsic will. They cannot control their behavior, or their destiny. It's simply shaped by external things, either pain or pleasure. You can reward them with pain, punish I mean, reward them with pleasure, punish them with pain. And so B.F. Skinner, and that was a big thing popular with corporations and rulers of countries was let's use this Skinnerism to control people. And so I don't really like B.F. Skinner. I think that he sort of had this idea that humans are like farm animals and they can be just, you know, guided into certain behaviors through all this type of psychology, but it was powerful stuff. And then other things that started coming out, let's say, you know, ballpark around 1960 was things like Abraham Maslow, that a man can start to actualize himself. And even earlier than that was things like Viktor Frankl, you know, what man needs in life is meaning. And if you have meaning that can help you to endure all kinds of things. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. If you've got something special that you're trying to do, let's say, help your parents, help your child. You can endure all kinds of other difficulties and pain. And you can also be happy. And that came out of the experience, excuse me, both uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky with Brothers Karamazov. He himself had been put by the czar uh, in Siberian prison camps and was set for execution. They actually had him out to be executed and then had a blindfold on him and relieved him at the last moment, Fyodor Dostoevsky. And so he would talk about that. His experience in the camps was the men who had good memories from their childhood or who had something that they were focused on that they wanted to do, they did much better. And then Viktor Frankl, he was in the, you know, the concentration camps in World War II of the Germans. And he said, yeah, a man who had meaning in his life, who had a purpose, that would make him strong and resilient. Uh, so I think that's one of the things that a person wants to find in their life. And you could always change your purpose later, but having that strong sense of goals, it gives you energy, it gives you vitality, and it also protects you, I think, from getting into trouble. What I mean by that is when I wanted to be a good wrestler, I would not drink. I wouldn't drink any alcohol, not a drop. I wouldn't smoke a, a cigarette or marijuana or any BS because I wanted to be a good athlete. So it kind of keeps you out of trouble. I wouldn't want to stay out late, et cetera. So I think that can help you. A, a person, a man on a mission for a goal um, has to sort of, in a sense, purify himself, if you will, if he really wants to be top notch. You know. So I think that's good for a person. Um, and so when you hang around with other people too, you want to try to hang around with people who are going somewhere with their life because they'll get you to behave well. If you hang around people that are drifters, that really don't have a goal, they're going to want to get drunk or stoned or all these other things, which are very detrimental to one's life. I've seen people just experiment once with marijuana and it's been laced with other things like PCP and they've had schizophrenic breakdowns. Um, 
and people can be institutionalized from that. You can you can destroy your whole life in one night of just being stupid. Um, I've also seen all kinds of things. You know, I cover emergency rooms, people getting drunk at sporting events and falling down a bunch of stairs, having major you know fractures and other injuries. I see all kinds of things. People doing all kinds of stupid things because they don't know what to do with themselves. Like I don't like these motorized skateboards. I've seen major intracranial bleeds from those things. You know what I'm saying? The human body, we're only meant to run, okay? A bicycle's faster than we're meant to go at. You get on one of those uh, motorized uh, skateboards or whatever you call them, you get major intracranial bleeds, skull fractures and stuff. So anyways, what I'm trying to say is when you're focused on trying to do something good, your world might be a little narrow, but it eventually leads to good things. Absolutely. And what exactly does good mean? How do you define that? Okay, yeah, that's another question too, because then now we're starting to move into some more stuff. Okay, I'll go into a little psychology history and I'll come back to that question. Um, in the 1960s, one also had, and, and by the way, that's what Thomas Shaz said. Thomas Shaz basically agreed with Viktor Frankl. You know, Alfred Adler said, life is a quest for power, a little bit like what Nietzsche would say. Um, Jung was not as clear, but, you know, he did think religion was a lot more important than Freud did. That was part of his reason for breaking away from Freud. But um, well, then along came these guys like Aaron Beck, and David Burns with uh, cognitive therapy school, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. And to me, that's a little bit like Shakespeare. Nothing is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. That you can simply decide if something's good or bad on a whim. And don't get me wrong, sometimes you do need to reframe how you look at an issue, but you can't always completely do that, okay? You're in love with somebody, they reject you, that makes you sad, okay? You can say, well, there's other fish in the sea, you're still sad, okay? I don't care how you look at it differently, you're sad. Someone you love dies, you're sad, okay? There's nothing you could do about that, and that's a real feeling. So there is something to cognitive behavioral therapy, but it only goes so far. Um, and then the next thing is, what I sort of came to the conclusion too, as I read more about this is, there's a lot of good psychology in Christianity, because it has a lot of things that psychology doesn't have. Psychology is kind of fun to study. You study it at first in school, and it seems kind of stupid. A bunch of research experiments, you're like, this has nothing to do with me. But then you get into more advanced stuff, and then I think it's pretty good. You start reading about like the Stanford prison experiment, how people behave so bad. You read about the Solomon Ash experiment, where there'd be like one examiner person with nine persons, confederates on his side at the table, and then one new person comes in the subject, and they would all agree with something that everybody in the room knew was not true. But the other person would say, would, the, the new person would go along with it. And that's kind of a weakness of human nature is that most people will go along with peer pressure. So it really takes kind of a strong, courageous, smart person to not go with peer pressure. And that's what I think also is one of the secrets of somebody being what I would call smart, is that they are confident enough and personally strong enough to trust themselves because there's tremendous pressure, for example, in the nutrition world to promote keto, Mediterranean diet. But when you look at it, it's nonsense. Okay. But there's unbelievable, there's a lot of peer pressure. That's what's promoted by pretty much almost all the major universities, for example. So a, a good, smart thinker is somebody who can, I like six blind men and an elephant. You know that one? Yeah. Yeah. So six blind men and an elephant means that the first guy, holds the elephant tail, says it's a rope. Next guy holds its ear, says it's a rug, for example. One holds its leg, says, oh, it's a tree. And the point being is Aristotle said one must, uh, the first step to an intelligent conversation is to withhold your emotions. So you can look at it from all the different point of views. And then you want to come up and have like a bird's eye view to see the entire issue. And I think that's a big part of being smart. And that's often going to mean refuting whatever is the common standard. So it takes a certain amount of bravery. Like, for example, that's one thing I like about Dr. McDougall. Dr. McDougall will say, no, no, no. This conventional way of looking at a situation, it is wrong. And I had the, I, like I said, I've gone through the experience now when I reviewed all the medical textbooks. My kids are growing up, you know, I got some time on my hands. I sit there and I go through the textbooks. I'm like, they're wrong. The medical textbooks on almost every significant issue. They basically say everything is just caused by uh, unknown causes, idiopathic, and therefore you got to take our pill or have our surgery rather than it is actually known the cause of the coronary artery disease, diabetes, hypertension, most autoimmune disease, et cetera. But you, you see what I'm saying? It's like Mozart had said, an artist and Beethoven said the same thing. In order for an artist to become great, they must trust themselves. And so you have to be able to handle having an opinion and a point of view that is completely rejected by the mainstream. OK, and don't get me wrong. A lot of people, once they hear you give your reasons for it, they'll come around to agreeing with you. But it's actually tech, very difficult to do that initially. And very few people actually do it. Um, so part of being a good thinker, I think, means you can do that. Uh, trust yourself and follow something to the truth, the conclusion as surprising or shocking as it is. 
Um, let's see what else. Oh, other things that I noticed. Psychology seemed to me a little bit uh, weak. And what I mean by weak was whatever the new popular trend is, it seems to always accept it. You know what I'm saying? And I don't think that's good. One of the things I like about religion is religion says, no, the Ten Commandments do not need to be rewritten every year or every decade. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's what they are. Okay. And what I've seen is going back to Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky, what he said is if there is no God, then everything is permitted, even cannibalism. And I think that that's where things are at nowadays. And for example, you say, well, what are you talking about? For example, abortion going up, 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 and up. And there are special situations when an abortion is reasonable. There are some really difficult situations that happen around the time of childbirth, okay? Is the mother or the baby only one of them can live? Well, I say, let the mother live. She, you know, she can have another baby in the future. And those are difficult situations, but those things do happen. Okay, they're rare though, all right? But one of the things I'm saying is nowadays, the abortion is so common, they'll take the baby and they'll take the different parts of the baby and they'll sell them to make medications and people will eat those medications. And I'm like, that's cannibalism, okay? You can call it what you want, but that's cannibalism. You can call it science, you call it whatever you want. It's still a form of cannibalism, okay? And once you go down that slippery slope of atheism, so basically there's, those are two major worldviews. If you say man is created in the image of God, like the beginning of Genesis, you therefore say he is part, uh, part divine, okay? So he's also part beast, but he's also part divine. Therefore, he should be entitled to natural rights. He should be entitled to you know, respect, privacy, free speech, and all these things. So the smallest minority, as Ayn Rand has said, is the individual. And I think when you start with that, you can make a society that's good for everybody. But when you go down the path of atheism, then you go down the path of Darwinism, which is also the path of eugenics. The reason why the British Empire loved Darwinism back in the 1800s was they basically said they are superior to everyone else. And therefore, other countries deserve to be colonized by them. You know what I mean? And on my ancestors, half my family was from Ireland. So they were really brutalized by the Irish who said, you are inferior. You're only designed to be slaves. You have no right to have uh, all these other things. Because I, you know, I, I spoke to my grandfather and to my great uncles and whatnot, and they told me an Irish man could not own a horse. Um, he could not go to school. They didn't want them to learn how to read. All this type of stuff. So society becomes rather brutal when it's atheistic because then it's ruled by force. Because the whoever is the ruler, they become the equivalent of God. It's like a, like a Roman emperor, you know? So you don't want to go down that path. A lot of people think, well, yeah, I hope it was atheism. Then I'm free. I don't have to obey, obey all these rules. And don't get me wrong. Churches can do a lot of stupid things. There's a lot of people that will behave like a jerk within a church context. But overall, it makes people behave a lot better than they otherwise would. And there's also the, the steps from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The New Testament, in addition, what did Jesu Christu add? He especially emphasized the importance of forgiveness. Love thy neighbor. And like the lady who had been caught committing adultery, he said, now go and sin no more. He didn't tell her, you know, you know, I'll see you next week. You know, he said, don't do this anymore. But which is kind of like something you tell somebody who's screwing up, you know, with alcohol or some other thing. But still, he was big on forgiveness. And that's a good thing, too. You know, Gandhi had said, if, it, if we always go an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, Everybody will end up blind and no teeth. Okay. So you have to you have to say, let us forgive and move along. And Hazel Crystal also emphasized love thy neighbor. So those things have a ripple outward effect that leads to a society that can be nice for everybody. Okay. And that's what you kind of hope for. And it begins with the individual. So yeah, I think you have to emphasize individual rights and individual, you know, privacy, all those things in order to have things as good as they could possibly be. Uh, so those are things I like. Also, if you ask me, let's say as a Christian, what is good? Well, I could say, well, good behavior would be like Jesus Christ and the other saints, male and female, for example. I can easily answer that question. What is good art? I can easily answer that question. Sistine Chapel, um, in terms of painting, and a whole bunch of other ones. Uh, Michelangelo statue, the Pieta, in terms of statuary, architecture. I can tell you the cathedrals. I can answer all those questions. You ask a psychologist, what is good behavior? They might tell you that you can hold a job. Okay, that's nice, but it's not that inspiring. If you look at Alcoholics Anonymous, who had the best results? Yes, there are the rules. You know, there's like 10 rules of don't drink anymore. But there's also, they notice that the persons who said, well, that addiction to alcohol is a major thing in their life. Every day they want to get their alcohol for the day. Excuse me. So they need something to transfer their energy to. You know, it could be falling in love. It could be something else. But what it was also found was persons who transferred their energy to Christianity, they had much better success and not relapsing into alcoholism, okay? And there's a lot of pressure in psychology to reject religion and especially Christianity and to push patients as much as possible towards psychiatrists where they tend to be over-medicated. Because it's one of the big myths 
of modern science and medicine is that these psychiatric medicines work. They actually don't work very well. They sometimes can be helpful in the acute phase to temporize a person who's a little bit out of control, if you will, especially somebody who's psychotic, okay? But they really don't work well. When you start looking at the follow-up data for treatment of depression, anxiety, et cetera, the longer they're on these meds, the worse their outcomes. Are you familiar with Soteria? Soteria, nope. Soteria is an interesting story. What it was, was that the head of the psychiatric um, NIH equivalent, he took all these schizophrenic patients and he had them live in apartment houses. Um, I think it was in the San Francisco area at that time. This was probably back around the 1970s. And what they found was the psychiatric schizophrenic patients who lived in these apartment houses, eventually, I think about 80% of them were able to come back and function in society versus if you did the opposite, put them on the antipsychotic medicines, only about 20% were eventually able to function in society. So incredibly better results uh, when you kept them in a personal context. And it wasn't run by psychologists or anything. It was just run by persons who volunteered to work in the apartment. They felt it would be worth a try. And they were just nice to the patients, but they did. It was not like they were counseling them or anything. They were just, they just sort of supervised the apartment to prevent problems if there were any. Um, so that's rather amazing. That's called Soteria. There's a book about it. There's videos about it. You'll see. Oh, and you want to hear something funny? Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. So here's this guy. He was like the head of the, the, the psychiatric United States for research. And when he got these results and then they were repeated, the psychiatric association got him fired from his job because they were pissed off. If all these schizophrenics could be treated with this outpatient apartment situation, then they would lose a lot of money. So they said, oh, he's biased, he's biased. This was a foregone conclusion. No, it was repeated several times. Uh, so, and it's been shown in other contexts as well. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, and I, th I think there's a lot of truth in that. So what I'm saying is, if meaning is the most important thing, and Viktor Frankl will say that, Thomas Schaas will say that, and a lot of other people, one of the things somebody who's being helpful as a psychologist, psychotherapist is to help the person find meaning in their life, find a goal, find a purpose. Because I remember myself, when I had that conversation with my mother, it like changed my life. It's, instead of being sad and feeling sorry for myself, I said, I've got a new goal. And I all my energy went into that. I was real psyched up. I don't know if I told you that story. I, I looked out the window of my dorm room. I walked to the balcony. There's vomit on the ground. And I'm like, good. You guys go ahead and get drunk. Because I was really scared and intimidated. I had never taken honors classes in, in high school. I was just recruited as an athlete, not as a student. Okay, so I'm like, I only got like B minuses my first a set of grades. I was afraid I was going to flunk out because I didn't even take any hard classes yet. But once I had this vision of what I was going to attempt to do, I got this tremendous energy. Then you know what you do? You find somebody who's good at it. I found this guy named Jay Ream who was getting A pluses in the really most difficult classes. And I had known him from high school, kind of. Okay. But we weren't, we were living on opposite sides of the campus. They don't let you live near somebody who you've known before, which is another bad thing. I didn't like that. So anyways, I asked him like, how do I study for school, man? And uh, I just started hanging around. He goes, well, you hang around with me. And that's a good thing. Hang around with them. Don't just talk to them once. Hang around with them because you'll see their little habits. And I saw how he would take condensed notes and he'd make an entire condensed note file. I would see how he would study so much at the library. Anyways, I got a whole bunch of little tricks from him. And I just started getting better and better at school. And I took a study skills class. And then I kind of figured it out. Basically, what is college? It's like a memorization contest. So you want to be get good grades? You become good at memorization. And once I understood that, I started to crush things uh, academically. Um, wow. And you you put so much effort and hard work into everything you do. Is is burnout ever a thing, like pursuing your passion? Have you ever encountered the kind of overwork because you love your work so much? That can happen. But if you're doing the right thing, it doesn't happen too much. For example, I would never do uh, an all-nighter. I never did a single all-nighter in my life. Um, and it's because I was always prepared. I mean, I studied almost every day. And it's also, you know, I was a little, I was sad and lonely that I didn't have a girlfriend at that time. I, my old high school girlfriend, I saw her on the summer and then we broke up after the first summer and she came out a few times, but not much, but most of the time I was alone. And the reason I mentioned that is I know some guys that went to state schools and had these deep girlfriend, boyfriend relationships. And I think it did interfere with their studying, <laughs> you know, cause they felt they had to entertain each other too much perhaps versus for me, there was nothing distracting me. I just wrestled studied, wrestled, studied. That was my, my life. Um, and I don't, I didn't burn out just because that was my hope in life. You know, that was it. It was kind of like, you know, you know, the Hernan Cortez burned the boats when they went to Mexico story. Basically there was no other option. Either you succeed in school or you flunk out 
And I sort of felt like a little bit embarrassed. You know, I had been when I was young, like this champion wrestler guy. And I had a lot of friends who looked up to me and then I got injured and they were kind of like sad in a sense that their athletic sports hero had kind of gone down physically. And I kind of saw myself, I'm like, I don't want to fuck this up. I'm like, I screwed up my athletic career by letting myself get injured and coming back too soon. And now I've got a chance at this academic stuff. I am not going to screw this up. I am not going to screw this up. So I had incredible self-discipline. I mean, there was not, I wasn't going to let anything get in my way. Cause I sort of felt this is my ticket out of all this sadness and loneliness. And believe me, I hated it. I went from having beautiful girlfriends. I'll even tell you a story. It's a little vulgar, but I'll tell you a story just so you know what it was like. I was, I think, a sophomore in high school. I was going out with this girl, and she's pretty nice, but she told me on a Friday night she's going to break up with me. Okay, and I'm like, okay. I don't know why she broke up with me. Maybe she likes some other guy. She just wanted to break up with me. I'm like, oh, well. I knew this other girl liked me. I called her up. She came over to my house. My parents weren't home. I slept with her Saturday morning, okay? Then I went to this party Saturday afternoon, and this other girl liked me. And I ended up sleeping with her. Okay. And now, and this only happened once in my whole life. And then my old girlfriend found out about it and she was jealous and pissed off. So she told me she wanted to go back out with me. I'm like, okay. And she came over that night. So what I'm trying to say is that's the kind of thing that can happen to an athlete in high school. And that never happened ever again in my whole life, but that could happen. And then to go in the next four years and not have a single girlfriend. Okay. It's a big difference. And then same thing in medical school, pretty much. It, Cause it, again, you go to class, you're in a room with 300 people. You don't know anybody and that's it. Okay. So Actually, my senior year, I dated this one professor lady, but that was a brief thing. Okay, senior so anyways, when I was in medical say, school, or when, when I was in medical school. Oh, okay, okay, just making sure because I, I wasn't sure senior year of high school or medical. No, medical school. So what I'm what I'm trying to say though is, when you're an athlete and you're at your high school place, you're popular. There's friends, all kinds of fun, crazy things happen, and you have high status. But the rest of my life, for a long time, then I had what I would consider low status. And like I said, the three things that attract a woman, you got to have uh, some type of status in whatever the environment is. You have to know how to talk to women at least a little bit. Um, and then you have to have access to them. You have to meet them. And so what I didn't have any of, and I think a lot of men would care about this, is any access. So you want to be somewhere where you're going to, where you're about to talk to people. High school is like the best place because you know everybody. Everybody knows each other. You, 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 there's a tremendous amount of information. Like if you date a new person you never met before, you meet them on the internet or something, there's going to be a ton of games played so they figure out if they're comfortable with you and vice versa. And that can take a long time. And you don't really even want to go through that. You don't even know who you're talking to as a man or a woman at first. So anyways, all I can say is it was a, I was so sad and lonely that I was so motivated to never, ever let this happen to me again. And it sort of seemed like the way out was, and also I was around a lot of great scientists and doctors. For example, when you're at Stanford, the biology professors are like superstars. They'll have their pictures in the school newspaper, in the biology news, they're the professors talking. And then I had that one friend in biology class we're like, wow, this professor wrote this paper and he was published in you know, Scientific American and Nature. And they were like our heroes. So I was like, and they, they were actually bigger heroes, the, the PhDs than the MDs were. There was sort of an attitude that if you're an MD, you're a sellout. You know, you could have been a scientist and you sold out, you're just gonna go make money as a doctor, an MD. There was that kind of attitude at Stanford. So anyways, I had this vision and with my buddy that we wanted to be great scientists. We would go bird watching and we would be figuring out all the birds. We would be talking about the ecology of it. We really had conversations like, and then I took all these electives. I took electives in bird watching. I took electives in botany and classifying plants and stuff. I really wanted to be a biologist. I mean, that's not a joke. I told you the story about when I went to Palo Alto Baylands. And I asked the, the, they have a, they have a little nature center over there. I'm like, uh, can I please see your field guide? They go, we don't have a field guide. I'm like, what do you mean you don't have a field guide? I was annoyed by that. And so I wrote a field guide for them. Okay. You know, I was really busy and I, I took all the time. I went there and I mapped out all the birds and all this stuff. And I just wrote a field guide just for the hell of it. It wasn't for a class or anything. And I'm just telling you, that was my psychology. Like I'm going to become a great biologist or a great doctor or something. I don't know what it is. I'm just going to push, push, push till I figure it out. Um, and so because of that, I think that really helped me. You know, I had a good goal. I wanted to sort of achieve my way out of sadness and loneliness and do something eventually that I thought was good. Um, and so, you know, either helping people or nature or society or something. I didn't know when I was young. You don't know initially unless you're lucky enough to know. I think a lot of people. So, but I think that was good. Right. And I and many other people looking at your channel or your work even now are continually astounded by that just energy pouring out of you into everything you do. So I have to wonder, do you ever 
do you ever get tired <laughs> even on the scope? It's, it's a little different from the burnout question, I guess. Just how do you how do you manage this consistently high level of energy? Is it just really just healthy lifestyle? Yeah, well, I think it's because I'm very simple. Um, and I think that's a big thing that gives a person energy. There's, there's no bullshit in my life. Um, and, and that's not easy to accomplish. Uh, and, and, and my life changed a little bit. I used to be primarily a surgeon, imaging guided surgeon, interventional radiologist. And I sort of then became more of a primarily a neuroradiologist. I did two fellowships. And as a neuroradiologist, actually, my life became better for being a writer and, and video maker in the sense that when I was a nurse, when I was in, when I was an imaging guided surgeon, I get paged all the time. I'd have to run over to the hospital, drain an abscess, put in a kidney, drain his tube, percutaneous nephrostomy, all this stuff. My life was unpredictable. Versus once I'm a neuroradiologist, I know when I'm on call, which isn't that often, and I know when I'm off, and I can just when I'm off, I can just concentrate. Plus, also my wife, I told you how we used to have a fun house run by me with a big tennis court in the backyard, basketball court basketball court in the house, all the stuff. And I loved it, but I had to maintain the house. There was a lot of work. I had to maintain the pool. And so my wife, you know, decided she was upset because it wasn't, it was like a man's house, not a woman's house. And she's a show off and she wanted to have a better homes and gardens type of house. So for the sake of the kids, I stayed with her. I should have divorced her though, but I stayed with her and I went to the new house and the new house is a totally female house. It's real nice to look at if you see it when it's all decorated and she does have a gift for that. But the good news came out of it. I'm like, okay, it's your house. It's your dog. You take care of the house and the dog. I didn't have to do anything. So with that, the significance of that was I used to spend many hours every week on the maintenance of the facility, all right? Paying all the bills, making sure the, the chlorine was good in the pool, all that. Now I was a free man. So I just sat down to read and I would ask myself basic questions. I had done, so, I had done a lot of reading before that, but with the new house, I did even more. I could sit down all day long and just try to understand things. And I would try to understand things. What causes diabetes? What causes hypertension? What causes cancer? What causes dementia? And I had a situation where I give lectures at where I work and um, I would always want to make my lectures great because there are a lot of the people who are my heroes. There used to be medicine, more of what you would call a sage on the stage. Okay, some old time person. A lot of times older doctors are better than younger doctors because younger doctors tend to be chicken shits, all right? They're always afraid. They want to get promoted. They don't want to ruffle any feathers. And so they're kind of, they don't say much and they don't know that much yet. They don't have that much experience. You could be straight A's and perfect board scores and everything all the way through residency. And you just don't have much clinical experience. Okay. Some old guy who's done, let's say it's, you're talking about appendicitis and appendectomies. The old guy's done 400 appendectomies. Okay. The young guy who's just out of his residency, he's done 30. Okay. He just doesn't have the experience of the old guy. So what, and the old guys, they don't, they're not, they're about ready to retire. They don't really care. They'll sit there and tell you the truth. So anyways, I wanted to kind of kind of become like him. McDougal's a perfect example, okay? He's an old guy. He'll just tell you the truth. He doesn't really care. What are you going to do? He's not worried about what he's going to do next week. He's not worried about getting promoted to assistant professor or full professor. No, he's, he's an old guy. He says, look, I've been doing this 50 years. Take it or leave it. Here's the truth, okay? So um, I wanted to kind of become another one of those because I admired those guys a lot. A lot of these old sage on the stage doctors. And medicine used to be a little more aggressive in, in, than it is now. But I think... You want to be nice to everybody, but it is good to have an opinionated old professor. You know, those old doctors, they know a lot and it's good to have them around. So I, the, right now there's a, there's a move away from that type of thing. And I think it's a, I think it's a detriment to medicine. You need to have old people who can be rude and who can be, who can be cantankerous and controversial because they'll say stuff that needs to be said. Absolutely. And as I point out before, that's part of why people really like your stuff, because you're just you're saying what needs to be said, you're speaking from the heart and everyone can can see that. So I think you have become a sage on the stage. Huh. Yeah, I, I kind of like it, too. It's also the thing that for me to do regular clinical medicine, regular medicine, you know, there's the internal medicine aspect, Nancy yielded a pill, send a bill. And then there's also like for in my field, I primarily work as a neuroradiologist. I do some body imaging as well. And I still do a little bit of interventional, you know, procedures and whatnot. But a doctor has to go to work and they have to generate billing codes. So there's only certain things you get paid for. And any place a doctor works for is always going to want them to generate billing codes. So that requires probably only an IQ. I don't know for me about maybe 125 to do 130 five, maybe to do well, 140 to do great. And I've got more intellectual energy than that. And it's sort of like, it limits you. It makes you do exactly what you have to do. Versus what I enjoy about writing books and making videos is I can be more creative. I can put my own individual touch on it. 
And I also think that there's lots of good people in this world who have simply sort of drifted away from the knowledge of what's possible. What I mean by that is one of the things I try to show with my videos, I try to show a little bit of good art, show them some good philosophy, because most people, they haven't heard of these things and it's there. So anybody who's got the curiosity, they can follow these things up more, look up the artist, look up the philosopher, whoever it might be. And I think that that's a good thing because there's a tendency like the public school system to push people into materialism. There's no such thing as God, life has no meaning. You might as well get drunk or get stoned and just have fun, okay? But that leads to a deterioration over time. It degrades you to think that way. So having some higher goal to push yourself towards, it ennobles you. And also having some sense of art, philosophy, and all these other things. Plus what I've also seen in my life is that there's a lot of bullying out in the regular world. And a lot of people, they're not very articulate. They don't ever read. Most people never read a book again after freshman year of high school because they're so turned off by great expectorations by uh, Charles Dickens, Julius Caesar, you know, when they're freshmen in high school, they're just not ready to read Shakespeare and things like that. And there's other books of similar note, the freshman year. So they see reading as painful and they never read again after life. And what I see happen to these people is they tend to end up in minimum wage or low paid jobs, but they also are very vulnerable to being messed with because they can't articulate themselves very well. They can't write very well. And they often get treated unfairly in life. I see it. Okay. And so what I'm saying is, don't get me wrong, there's no guarantee anybody's going to be treated fairly. But if a person is articulate and they can enunciate their arguments, they can speak and accurately describe a situation, they get treated a lot better. Um, so having good interpersonal skills makes a big difference in a person's life. But also a person who can articulate things precisely it's harder to mess with them, okay? Don't get me wrong. They can still be abused and treated unfairly, but they at least have a chance to speak. Um, and so, because I've seen a lot of people, they just get screwed over. They have no ability to articulate the, the truth of their situation. They just sort of take whatever happens to them. And a lot of them get screwed over. They get paid way less than they deserve. Um, they get forced to do stuff they really shouldn't be forced to do, et cetera. So what I'm trying to say is, Getting well-educated is not just an enjoyable hobby. It also makes your life better. You, you, it, it, it sort of opens up all these horizons of creativity, of skill in writing and speaking, and they're enjoyable. I mean, you get a calm pleasure. They're ennobling, if you will, looking at nice art, reading good books and all this stuff versus I, I don't like popular culture. I don't even own a TV. I've haven't I've had, I've never owned a TV in my whole life. I mean, when, when I was a kid, my parents had one in the house, but I've never owned a TV. Um, there's nothing good on TV because if you look at the normal distribution, they have to market it towards what you would call an average person, if you will, because that's where the advertising money is located. So the content is always going to be kind of dumbed down. Um, and, 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 and if you watch TV a little bit, you'll notice that you fall into all these familiar patterns. You know, for example, I don't watch movies anymore because they're they're almost all the same pattern, something kind of vulgar. And nowadays the movies I think are kind of are kind of terrible. They're they're largely based on action and special effects. There's no deep personal story. I like the old movies. I like, you know, they're they're warm. There's real love there. You feel the emotions, you know. There's an emotional message, there's a psychological message, and that's much deeper and more important than all the action or special effects. Yeah. Can you name some favorite movies? Well, it's a wonderful life. I love that movie. Also, you know, I America used to be much more macho. I used to love all the Rocky movies uh, with Sylvester Stallone. Um, I like the old Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments. I loved all the comedies. These were great comedies when I was young. You know, John Belushi and Animal House, Bill Murray and Stripes, all that stuff. And Bill Murray had a great sentence. He said, in a conversation, <clears throat> most of the time, things are just, you know, question, response, question, response. And he says they're kind of predictable and boring. They're transactional, if you will. But he says, if you just hesitate for one moment and allow a thought to come into your mind and just let it go, you can have so much more fun in a conversation, you know? So I, I, I love that because I think he's very funny. Uh, Bill Murray. I, I loved him in Caddyshack too. I thought that was great. Thank and you. it also kind of reminded me of sort of like a new version of Oscar Wilde. So I'm a, I was a big fan of the writer Oscar Wilde. He was an Irish guy went to England and the English really hated the Irish. I'm, I'm pretty well schooled in Irish history and man, they were very cruel to the Irish. And here's this guy, he goes over there and he becomes the most popular playwright in the whole place. And he was very clever, his use of chiasmus, you know, to sort of, the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. He's full of sayings like that. 
Um, and so I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, or that he doesn't want to be, oh, actually, this might have been Groucho Marx, but he doesn't want to be part of any club that'll accept him. Yeah, that's Groucho Marx. Yeah, yeah, all that stuff is good. There's, there's a lot of clever wordplay in, in those old comedies. So I really enjoy that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, getting back to psychology, that to me seen where things went. Thomas Shaw's wrote the the myth of psychotherapy. Um, and so he was a good contrarian in the psychiatric field. And then I also saw something interesting. The Sometimes the writers who were not involved with universities, they were much better, okay? And one of them, I'm going to say something too. You might, this is a little bit vulgar, but it's something that men will talk about all, all the time. There was a guy who wrote a book called Mystery Method, okay, about how to seduce women, all right? And then there were all these university professors who wrote books about male-female relationships, okay? And so when I was trying to decide how to find a girlfriend or find a wife, I read all that stuff when it became available, right? And here's the observation I made. The guys who were just writing because they wanted to write about it, they wrote better books. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of BS in all those books too. You know, mystery himself is like six foot five, women like tall guys. And that was a big part of his mystery method, all right? But what I saw was they were just trying to figure out male-female relationships. Whereas the college professor would feel obligated to stay within a like a politically correct zone. Does that make sense? And their book would be so wimpy. You could tell they were just trying to get promoted and they weren't trying to understand male-female relationships. There's a lot of goofy things that happen in male-female relationships, okay? And you have to take a while to get your head around them. And you also have to have some relationships yourself to have the experience to understand them. And so I thought that was interesting. And it was part of my waking up to realize that a lot of the best work, it doesn't come from the universities, the professors, the people with the big name jobs. And also, I liked Arthur Schopenhauer. Um, Arthur Schopenhauer had said, the best books are always written by amateurs because the amateur studies the thing out of love and interest and just tries to understand it versus the professional feels obligated, like for making a teaching class to be comprehensive and includes all kinds of meaningless, worthless things. And quite often it's done simply in effort to get promoted or he'll stay within the guidelines. He's not going to contradict anything in his own field. And because of that, their books stink. It's like a cardiologist. A cardiologist can't write good about atherosclerosis because they have to promote stents. A cardiothoracic surgeon can't write well about atherosclerosis because they have to promote surgery. Because uh, if they did, like if a cardiologist said stents stink, you know, he might lose his job for that. Same thing with a surgeon who says, oh, bypass is totally overrated. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, I more and more as I got older and, and read more would see that that turned out to be the case. For example, in pathology, the authors writing about atherosclerosis, I'm like, holy crap, because usually people think pathologists don't know anything. They're like, oh, they just look at a microscope all day, you know, at tumors. These guys don't know anything about real disease. Are they really even doctors? Okay. And I'm like, holy crap. When I started reading the pathologists writing about atherosclerosis, I'm like, they're looking at it under a microscope. They're going to tell you, this is what's in this plaque. And I found that they were way better. So that was a, a shock to me. Uh, the pathology, because I had come from the background of being an imaging guy, surgeon. I used to do tons of angioplasties and stents. And I hung around with a crowd of cardiologists, cardiothoracic surgeons, vascular surgeons, and all this stuff. And I thought we were the group that knew atherosclerosis. And then it's these pathologists, you know, these, these nerds over in a laboratory looking at a microscope. They're the ones who figured it all out. And I knew that that to be the case because I would read their books and then I would correlate. I read a lot of CT angiograms, which is a CAT scan with intravenous contrast injected. And I'm looking at the clot. I'm looking at the atherosclerotic plaque. And I'm like, it's a blood clot. It's the same as a blood clot anywhere else in the body. That's what it is. And that's a, that's a major observation. That's an AO, academic orgasm, in terms of understanding atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is a blood clot. And it becomes organized, if you will, you know, by the immune system coming in and partially reabsorbing it or partially calcifying it, for example. But once you understand that atherosclerosis is a blood clot, then you can like understand almost all these complex things that are held by everyone else to be a mystery. The other thing, too, is a lot of the cardiologists, the so-called, these are like the most famous cardiologists in the world I'm about to refer to now. I, I won't even say their names, but... They're sitting there giving these lectures about atherosclerosis and they're talking about inflammation and all this stuff. And you know what? They're full of crap. They're trying to sell more drugs. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and I say that because look at atherosclerosis. And also there's other theories too. Oh, atherosclerosis is caused by bacteria. Bullshit. Even though, yeah, you find bacteria in, in uh, some atherosclerotic plaques, they're relatively a wide variety of them. Atherosclerosis didn't need to give any antibiotics to cure atherosclerosis. You just cured it with diet. The diet's the main thing. And what I think is happening is excuse me, the bacteria are like scavengers, saprophytes. They see a plaque and for them, that's food. You know, what do you grow bacteria on? A blood agar plate. So they they don't cause the atherosclerosis. They secondarily infect it. Does that make sense? Mm, and that gets yeah. you into a whole other theory of what you call, you know, germ theory versus terrain theory. And what I'm referring to is what's more important in an infection. 
the immune system of the individual or simply the exposure of the individual. And there's some merit to both points of view, but terrain theory, so to speak, is markedly under-recognized. And terrain theory also relates, if you will, to cancer. You know, the traditional cancer theory is, oh, it's caused by genetic mutations and DNA damage and stuff. That's called the somatic mutation theory. And the other theory is the metabolic theory of cancer, the Warburg theory, okay? Warburg theory is, is a thousand times better. It totally makes sense. You let your tissue become ischemic and the bacteria, the human cells will transform from aerobic metabolism with mitochondria to anaerobic, becoming like a bacteria, just running on glycolysis without oxygen because the tissue is hypoxic. So if you want to minimize your risk of cancer, minimize your risk of hypoxia. What causes hypoxia in the blood? Fat causes the RBCs to sludge together, deforms their shape so they can't deliver oxygen as well. Also, sodium is a vasoconstrictor, so that drops off oxygen supply to the tissue. Okay, so those things increase cancer. And there are things that do damage DNA, but you look at cigarette smoking, yeah, it damages DNA. Benzopyrene, for example, is carcinogenic to damage DNA. But it also causes vasoconstriction. It also, because it causes hypoxia, it causes um, hemoglobin to go up, making the blood thicker, causing more hypertension. So it does several different things. So anyways, when you start thinking down that path, you, you, you can learn a lot of useful things. And it tells the person what to do. I love how your brain just links together all of these different theories, biology, um, and that you're willing to go into the more esoteric things. For example, when you first mentioned derm theory versus terrain theory, I've never heard about terrain theory before. I had to look it up and I read more about it. I thought, this makes a lot of sense. Why don't more people talk about this? Yeah, because there's no money in it. If there's no money in something, it quite often won't get into the textbooks. And there's like this whole other world of literature that I started to discover when I had a little more time to read, when I sort of trend, when I sort of became more of a neuroradiologist instead of an imaging guided surgeon. When I was an imaging guided surgeon, I was really busy doing tons of cases. Like when I was in private practice at first, I worked at three hospitals. I would come home at nine o'clock at night. Um, and then um, what happened is my wife was working too much and I wasn't happy about that. I'm like, who's gonna spend time with the kids? So I changed to a different job where I had better hours. And then I gradually changed to being a neuroradiologist. There was, I kind of always wanted to do the brain, but I was a little bit turned off by the spine. Spines are kind of boring, but I've learned to view a spine as being like a pick line. For a neuro, for an interventional radiologist thrown in a pick line, it's like the uh, catheter, per perfectly inserted central catheter into the arm. It's almost like a Zen thing. I did so many of them, I did like 3000 of them that I could do it like almost in my sleep. And I learned to think that way about the spine. Uh, it's a little bit boring reading all these spines, but. Now I just go through them pretty quick. And, and I also invented a theory of spine. I don't know if I ever heard you, you ever heard me give that lecture on my ischemic spine. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I figured out how the spine works. That's, that's another story, but I, I actually, there were some papers about ischemic spine degeneration of the lumbar, but I figured out it's actually the entire spine. And anyways, that's an interesting topic in the future someday, perhaps. Yeah. Very brilliant. Just a very quick question. Well, I know this is actually a big question, uh, but clearly you are very invested in your in your work and you are excelling in it. And you also talk about, you know, we have to be paying attention to the, the family as one of the greatest sources of happiness in our life in our lives. So how does somebody who is so driven, such as you, so career oriented, um, I guess retain that sense of balance in life and and re recognizing that at the end of the day, it's your personal life, your family, which you have to cultivate for maximal happiness. Or is that even true? Well, I, I think it is. I think your family is probably going to be your greatest joy in life. And I think in general, the mothers tend to spend more time with the children than the fathers do. And also there was a little bit of a disagreement between my wife and I in terms of how the children were handled. And by that, I mean, I wanted to spend more time with them initially. She sort of felt like she should be in charge. And I didn't like it because like, for example, when I was engaged to my wife, she was like a perfect little angel, did anything I wanted. She wanted to marry me. Okay. You know, I was a pretty successful doctor and I came from a wealthy family and all this stuff. And once she got the magic ring on her finger, she's like, oh, okay, now she's the boss. And I'm like, how'd you become the boss? And it was, and it's like, she kind of started bossing me around. And the other thing she did to me too, is like, you know, I'm a pretty smart guy. I can handle myself pretty well in a discussion of a topic and articulate my points. But the wife started to say, well, you're just autistic or you have no common sense. And I'm like, Oh, okay. So you're going to win the argument. And then you know who else has power in a marriage? Whoever's family lives closer. So we live right next to her family. So, you know, she was with her sister and her mother and they're like, yeah, he's autistic. Do it your way. And I'm like, I'm outvoted three to one in my own house. What kind of nonsense is this? But it sort of happened the way. Plus early on, I was a surgeon primarily when the kids were young. So I was working a lot. For example, a good time to talk to a kid 
is when you're driving them to some activity, you know, a sport or a school or something, because the kid's strapped into the, their chair in the back and you can have a conversation with them. Because usually the kids are hyper, they're running around, you don't talk, it's hard to have a conversation with them that much. It kind of is. Plus kids go to their mother for everything. There's no food in this house. I'm hungry, you know, whereas they only come to the old man and they need help with school or so they got some special question. All right, so anyways, what I'm trying to say is the wife had more influence on them than I did when they were young. As they got older, I also learned too that you can't push a kid. What you have to do is give them some information, let them explore it. Like for example, I used to always buy the kids books and they never read a single book that I bought. And I'm like, what the hell is going on with these kids? Are these kids retarded? You got no curiosity? Come on. And then what I realized was no, because I'm a pain in the butt that when you give a person a book and tell them to read it, you're like imposing an obligation on them and nobody likes being told what to do. Versus once I learned, take them to the library or the bookstore or you know the online bookstore, let them pick the book themselves, then they would start to read the books. So I kind of learned how that works. Um, I also kind of learned, you know, that I kind of became, I guess you would call it almost a Zen parent. It was sort of like, Hey, I'm home. I'm in my office. Anytime you want, you can talk to me. Doors always open. And that actually worked out pretty well too. Cause that way I didn't really annoy them, but they could talk to me whenever they wanted. And it kind of happened that way. But I made some other mistakes. I think I might've already told you I screwed up with the kid in tennis. Yeah. 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 And yeah I screwed I up. I didn't know I screwed up. All mm -hmm. right. I, I did good with having them in art. And I think the wife kind of screwed that one up in the sense that I had the kids all take drawing classes, which I thought was a great thing because you can connect drawing to whatever you do the whole rest of your life. And it increases your ability to see things objectively. But she kind of had this idea, I'm going to turn them into a bunch of bohemian artists. And she kind of frowned on the thing, which I think was a mistake because they got pretty good, but they didn't develop as far as they could have. Um, what else was something that happened? Yeah, the other thing too is my wife didn't really understand me. I think we had a little bit of a Hollingsworth gap, not to be rude, but it's the truth. Hollingsworth gap is a psychiatrist who work with really high IQ people. And I've run into this a lot of times in my life. I am often thinking about things in an esoteric way, which I think is good for a long-term picture. I look at things like life is a marathon, you know, how you, this will build out over the course of a person's life. And what I mean by that is I would emphasize the aesthetic appeal of a subject because that's what gets you to like it. Um, and if the motivation for academics and learning comes from within, the child will read on their own. For example, I work with my kid in tennis. I showed him how, you know, Pete Sampras used to hit balls against a tennis wall and I built a tennis wall for the kid and he could do it. Okay. And so he loved it. And so that's what I'm saying is I would teach the kid, for example, we love Steve Irwin, you know, the Australian guy like Crocodile Dundee and stuff. And so I had the kid make PowerPoint presentation for school and me and the kid were real happy. We went to the zoo together and the other kid too. We had a lot of fun. I taught him about bird watching and the wife, in my opinion, should have stayed out of all that stuff, but she had this idea that I'm going to drive them crazy by being like, she's like, why does a fourth grader need to know PowerPoint? I'm like, the kid doesn't need to know PowerPoint, but what I'm trying to show them is sort of the, if you will, the beauty of it all. You know, it's, I love Steve Irwin and I love going to the zoo and I had kind of grown up, you know, going bird watching and all this stuff. My wife kind of had this idea, this is all bullshit, okay? Get good grades in school, become a doctor, make money and have a good life. And I'm like, you know, myself, I don't do well with that type of motivation. I don't really care too much about money. Um, so for me, I care about doing something that I feel good about. And uh, so, and also a lot of my desire to read came out of seeing my father read and talking with my uncles, for example. So I believe that in the long run, there was a good line in the movie Chariots of Fire where the runner was asked, how did he maintain his determination? And he says, how does a man run a race to the end? It comes from within. And the point that I was making is, if you have it built into you, I shall be the best I can be and I shall be good at these things that I care about. It just happens. You don't need to do external stuff. For what, example, what I'm trying to say is like, for example, let's say you have a kid in school. If the kid likes reading and reads on their own, they're going to become a very good student. You don't have to do anything else. It'll just come from within them. You know what I mean? Versus if the kid hates it, and you have to tell them, well, you, you can't go to your friend's house unless you finish all this homework first. You can take them to Kumon, for example. You know Kumon for mathematics? I actually think it's a good thing. And I had my kids in that for a while. But what I'm trying to say is once motivation is internal, you don't need anything external. The child just drives themselves. And that's what you want. And so I was trying to get that effect. And, she, and I wasn't always around. I was working a lot. She kind of had this idea that I'm a little autistic and crazy. You know, the... Harvard Autistic Genius was kind of like what they would call me. And they would call me Steincheck. Steincheck was this Polish ambassador guy who was a little bit of a party pooper, if you will, they would call him. 
and it was a worry ward and all this other stuff. So anyways, what I'm trying to say is I didn't like that because I felt like you're not getting it. These kids could do a lot of things if we just sort of let them enjoy it and explore it versus this idea. Like I personally would have a little bit of an attitude that school is kind of stupid. When I was in grade school, for example, I was suspended a bunch of times. I was put in a special classroom called a pod to be by myself. And the reason was I was smart. I would get the homework done in five minutes and joke around with my friends. Um, and so what, what I'm trying to say is they would have they drugged me as attention deficit if I was, a, as in the modern world of school. Um, what I, you ever heard of the, the book Whisperer by Donalyn Miller? No, actually. Okay. This is kind of a cool thing. So this lady, Donalyn Miller, she wrote a book called The Book Whisperer. I think she was a sixth grade teacher. And she made the observation that children don't like being forced to read a book for school and make a book report. So she said, you know what? She's just going to make a library in her classroom. So she, she got all these bookshelves, put them in her classroom, and had a really big selection, like a library for her students. And she told the kids, read whatever book you want. You'll have to give a five-minute presentation to class, but I don't really care too much about it. I'm just happy to see you reading. So the reason I tell you that is in the average, let's say, sixth grade class, let's say an English class, they might read during the entire year, three books the whole year maybe even two books, okay? And everybody kind of hates it and goes along with it reluctantly. In her class, what do you think was the average number of books read by the students? It's 41. Oh. And she had, her students were all by far the best students in the school. And that's yeah. what I'm saying. That would be my approach. You know, and we kind of joke too about the movie Colors where the two cops are talking or the two bulls and the, first, the young bull says, hey, want to run down there and screw one of those cows? And the old bull says, let's walk down there and screw all of them. And I'm, I'm kind of kidding. But the point I'm making is that if you do something out of desire and love, it just works. You don't need to play all these games and you don't need to make it unpleasant. It can be enjoyable. So if a kid likes reading, they just get good at school. <laughs> and you know, really also cool. if the kid has this idea that someday I could be an engineer, a computer programmer, or you know, a mechanic or design cars or something. Because for example, I had my kid drawing all these cool uh, hot rod sports cars and stuff and say, well, if you want to be a mechanic and work at the racetrack and stuff, you got to know your physics and your mathematics. So that will get the kid to learn it. You know what I mean? Um, you don't, life can be pleasant and enjoyable and fun. And, and that's how you should try to make it. You know what I'm saying? So we didn't always see eye to eye on that, but I know I'm right. <laughs> and yeah, and last question, if you don't mind, what if someone doesn't want kids how how do they still which is increasing a lot of people in our younger generations don't want kids for a variety of reasons do you think they can still achieve the maximal happiness or well kids bring you a lot of happiness you can't help loving them you know you just do i think we're biologically programmed that way um so it's an individual choice you could maybe adopt if they want uh, it's, it's a, certainly a very unique experience in life. There, there's nothing like having kids. I think what happens to a lot of people is they get a job like women, for example, and it's kind of fun through their mid twenties. And in their later twenties, progressively, they're seeing some of their girlfriends go off and have a baby and seem so happy. And some of them quit working even, and they're jealous and they kind of want that themselves. So what I'm saying is by the time you get to around 30, you've done the routine stuff. You've gone to the local restaurants, the local movies, the local shows, You've, you know, had the boyfriend, girlfriend, or husband, spouse, and you might miss it. What I would say is if you can't do that, what, one of the things I kind of summarize here is what I would call a good life. A good life is a life that was inspired by something sort of beyond themselves, whatever that might be. And if you know that you're doing something good and you're enthusiastic about it, you wake up in the morning and you want to go, you're excited, and that's good. And you'll also be a happy, enthusiastic person, and that will have uh, it'll rub off on the people around you. And it creates, like I said, this ripple effect of good things. And that's what you want. So you want to try to live like that. You don't want to get trapped into the rat race of, I have to make money so I can buy a nicer car. Because in the long run, that doesn't make you happy. Um, what, what makes you happy is the love of friends and family and the sense of you did the best you could in the areas that you could. So you feel good. You feel good about yourself. And like I said, that kind of goes back to Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer said, forget about a happy life. If you focus on trying to be happy, you're going to end up unhappy. What you focus on is trying to be the best you can be in the things you care about, whatever they might be. Um, so a meaningful life, a purposeful life. St. Paul, at the end of his days, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have run the race to the end. I have finished the race. Okay, whatever. You, you get my point. My point is that sense, like, and I have that sense. I, show, I don't know if you ever see my thing where I showed that painting of St. Thomas Aquinas 
where he's kneeling before the cross with Christ. And he says, have I done, you know, I wish I could have done more. And Christ said, no, you did good. You're doing fine. Okay. And so I'm kind of joking about that, but that's the sense you have. And, and I know that I have that, for example. So that makes me happy. Believe me, my life is screwed up in 10 different ways, but I feel happy that I know ever since I made that promise to my mother, I have followed through on it hundred percent as best I could. And I feel good about that. And I kind of, you know, Sometimes I feel a little sad. I feel like the Rodney Dangerfield field of medicine. I'm like, I'm one of the smartest doctors in the world. Okay. But nobody gives a rat's ass because patients have no money. So nobody cares. You know what I mean? Like my, I'll make these videos and I'll get a hundred views, 200 views. And then all these liars and BSers are getting, you know, a million views, but I still know I did the right thing. I put it there for the people who want to find it. And, you know, I did the best I could, you know, I don't have social skills, the marketing, the networking skills, the business skills, all that stuff that goes there. But I know that I have the other ones, you know, the ability to make something great and good. So I did that. And, you know, it's about the best I could do. And so, you know, what are you going to do? I'm, I'm getting old. I'm 59. So uh, I'm glad I'm doing this. I'm glad I got this going on, you know. Don't, don't say you're getting old, Dr. Rogers. I don't know if you know, but I recently interviewed a person who is almost 100 years old and is a doctor, Dr. John Scharfenberg. That interview is up on YouTube just as, as of this morning. And he is still teaching, still lecturing, full of passion. Just a, a great guy. So I, I advise you check that out because you're, yeah, you're yeah. not old. You're a spring chicken. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I still feel pretty young. I got lots of energy to exercise and all this stuff. And I remember Dr. McDougall said he had, remember his story about in Hawaii? He was working with the, the manual laborers, the farm workers with the sugar cane and all that. And then he was working with the people in the city. The people in the city were fat and sick, lots of cancer, impotence, heart disease, all this stuff. He says the manual laborers, They'd retire at 65, they've got a pension, they go to the Philippines, they get a new bride, and they'd raise a whole other family. So who knows? Maybe I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much, Dr. Rogers. It's a pleasure as always. We learned so much from you. And believe me, they're the people who are finding your videos, they're the ones who are meant to see them and they are deeply impacted by them. So thank you for all you do. Oh, th thanks.